Our second presenter is Georgina Coglin. Georgina's been in practice uh, coming up 10 years, at the last six or so of those years at the bar. Georgina has developed a busy criminal practice and appropriately for this morning, um, a large part of that practice now revolves around sex trials. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Georgina will focus on the area of um, child complainants in sex matters. And Georgina's happy to take questions as she goes along. If you um, would like to clarify a point or ask Georgina a question, please feel free to. And we'll be, after Ge Georgina's presentation is completed, we will open it up for questions for Justin as well. Thank you very much and please welcome Georgina Coglin. Sorry for the topic of the conversation this morning. It's not very nice to have to talk about sex this early in the morning, but it is, as Justin said, really, really, sex trials are the most prevalent trials of all in our county court um, system, at least. And of those trials, the, most, the ones that have the most priority are those involving children, where children are com the complainants and also cognitively impaired complainants, but I'm not going to go into that this morning. <coughs> but because of that, the fact that cases involving child complainants have the most priority, it's really important to um, be well prepared from the outset in relation to them. And that's also because the timelines that are involved in cases involving children are very tight. So you need to be well prepared from the outset. Um, there are really two aspects to what I want to talk about today uh, in relation to child complainants. And I don't speak with as much experience as Justin has. I don't speak with the same sort of force in terms of the views that I have about things. And that's, um, that's, uh, that's certainly a compliment to Justin in terms of the way he can um, say things with such certainty. I suppose what, the way I'm talking about it is to um, be, talk about the things that I've observed in trials and things that can assist defence in the way that child sex trials are now run. Um, things that can assist defence in the way that child sex cases are now run. So the two aspects I really want to concentrate on, the special rules that apply in child sex cases, and sorry to use that term child sex cases, but it's just easier than saying child complainants, ch children complainants in sexual offence trials, but it's just, so it's just a shorthand. But, so the first thing, special rules. The other thing is um, sources of other materials that you may want to try to get to assist a defence. Also, what I am focusing on in talking today is in relation to teenagers and not delving into the really, in my view, special cases where you've got young kids, which are very, very difficult uh, cases. And really what I'm saying concentrates on uh, teenage complainants. And there are a lot of cases where you've got complainants who are aged really between um, 13 and 15 or up to 16. <clears throat> As most of you would know, there are special rules that do apply in child sex cases. Uh, some of those include that you can't cross-examine a child complainant at a committal, um, which is obviously pretty significant. Uh, another one is that the, a special hearing is conducted prior to a trial being commenced. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about what the special hearing is and how um, the running of that may in fact assist defence. The other thing is that um, the, tr the special hearing must occur within three months of the, the accused being committed to stand trial. So that's where the tight timelines come in and that's why you need to give thought to things uh, really at, at the point that someone's charged really in terms of how a case is to be run. <clears throat> in terms of a special hearing, that um, basically enables for a child's evidence to be entirely recorded. It means that a child never sees a jury um, they, usually what happens is they do what's called a VAIR, which is a video audio, sorry, video, a visual audio recording of their evidence. It used to be called a VAIR and now it's called a VAIR. And that's just basically a video taped interview with a child, generally by a police officer who's trained to do that. And I'll go into a bit more detail later about the importance of that and, and perhaps the importance from a prosecution point of view, but then the, the the benefits that can be gained for defence uh, because of a VAIR. The other thing then is that they're cross-examined and that's recorded too, and that's it without the jury being present, and then that's played for the jury in the course of the trial. So they, the whole thing is basically a video that the jury watches. 
Now, these rules have been in place actually for a pretty short period of time, if you think about um, just generally the scheme the scheme that's been in place for child complainants and cognitively impaired complainants. And I've actually heard recently that it's going to change and that what's going to happen is rather than the um, special hearing occurring in the absence of the jury, it's actually going to occur in front of the jury. And that will have no impact for the complainant because they can never see a jury. But it would mean that a trial will be shorter because at the moment what you've got is often a couple of days pre-trial which is taken up with a special hearing followed by the trial starting proper. So it just means that timelines um, hopefully will be a bit shorter. I, I don't have any information about when that's to happen. It's just something I've heard and whether it does happen I, ca I can't say. Um, but it sounds like a sensible approach. In terms of um, a special hearing, the whole purpose of it is designed to, I suppose there's a number of purposes, but it's designed to uh, protect a complainant from a court environment. It's um, designed to prevent them from having to give evidence again. If there's a retrial, for example, because the whole thing's recorded, it just means if there's a retrial, the whole thing can be replayed. Um, so it's meant to lessen the impact of the court process on that person. And I, I, do, I do suspect that the, those objectives are, are achieved by that scheme, that, that the impact on a complainant is lessened. But the other side of that is that there is a real benefit to defence in special hearings being run. And there are a number of reasons for that. And I spoke about before these, um, the video recording of the evidence, the VAIR. There are real benefits to a VAIR being played. If, for those of you who haven't actually seen one, it's almost it's not the same as a, rec a recorded interview with an accused, but it, it has a bit of the same flavour because it is by a police officer. It's not by someone who... It's not by, a, an a, it's not by counsel. It's not someone asking questions who's experienced in doing that. It's a police officer asking questions to elicit information about an offence. And it's often in a very sterile um, room. It's, and you might have a very limited view of a complainant and that's what's played for the jury. One benefit for defence in having a VAIR is you know exactly what a complainant is going to say. That's their evidence in chief. It's all there for you. There's no surprises unless leave is sought to ask further questions, but generally that's not the case. So from the VAIR, you know what the evidence will be, and you can, of course, tailor your cross-examination to that because you know what's coming. And that's a great benefit. If you think about another trial where you've got someone giving evidence in chief for the first time, you've got an idea about what they're going to say because you've read their statement, but, but it rarely, rarely, rarely accords precisely with their statement. I'd say never would it accord precisely with their statement. But you've got the advantage with a VAIR where it does, where, it's, where, where that's the evidence in chief. The other aspect, the other benefit to a VAIR for defence is the fact that, and um, Justin touched on this with respect to remote witness evidence, it, it distances the complainant from the jury and there's a lack of engagement because of that. And I actually had a case um, not that long ago where it was a, a one aspect to it was a belief in age aspect. And you can imagine you're watching a VAIR and you see um, a girl there and she um, looks to be about 16 or 17 dressed as a 16, 17-year-old girl, wearing makeup, speaking as if she's 16 or 17 years old. But in actual fact, when you met her, she was tiny, like a tiny little 13-year-old girl that she was. And the jury had no impression of that whatsoever because she didn't come into court. So all they ever see is the recording of her evidence um, where they don't get a full impression of what she actually looks like, which was very important in a defence case where belief in age is an issue. The other um, example, again, this is the focus on teenagers, but you'll often get a situation where a teenage girl will be um, very reserved in a vair, hair on her face, um, head down, slumped. Sometimes I've seen he uh, feet hanging over the sides of chairs, very relaxed, um, and perhaps not the kind of impression the prosecution would want a witness to give when giving evidence about a serious sexual assault. So that's a benefit for defence as well that there is that, um, that distance and that betrayal of the complainant in that manner at that time, which is all they see of her, him or her, I should say. 
another advantage for defence is potentially where you've got a situation, and I saw this happen recently, where there were two um, child complainants, a number of theirs, so they went through all the special hearing process, then that's all played for the jury. It wasn't until day five of the trial that the jury actually saw a live witness. So they've been sitting in court, they've heard the judge speak, they've heard the prosecutor speak, defence counsel speak, seen all these videos played and then finally see someone in person. And what you could really sense at that time was that, that they were, they, there, was, there was something lost in the communication for them, that they weren't getting, there was no engagement for them because there was no one there actually telling them um, their own story or really engaging with them. So that's a real disadvantage for the prosecution because there's that um, distance between the, the evidence um, being communicated by video rather than in person. The final thing really in relation to the, the advantages for defence because of the, the fact of the VAR being played is that it can be clinical and structured. The VAR can be clinical and structured and the questions asked there um, it can be clinical. It's not, it's not a situation, for example, where you have evidence in chief in court where you have an experienced advocate asking the questions um, and there being a storytelling, a progression, and something that engages the jury in that, in that way. Um, so that's absent, generally, in a VAR. The other thing I wanted to talk about this morning was <clears throat> sources of other material that can assist a defence. And these are things that can be done pre or post committal, just depends on um, how the case is going and whether things arise at committal, for example, that need to be explored. And there are a, a number of ways of accessing material. And the first is Section 32C applications, and I'll go into a bit more detail about what they are and what they involve in a moment. Uh, then subpoenas generally. And then thirdly, Facebook and social media, which is becoming more and more useful, I think, as a defence tool, as some of you may well know. In terms of confidential communications, I don't want to get bogged down in the detail. I assume some of you, most of you know what they are. What I say about them is not necessarily specific to child complainants because, of course, the issue of confidential communications can arise in adult complainant cases as well. It's not at all specific to child complainants. Essentially what it is, a confidential communication is communication between a complainant and a medical practitioner or counsellor in the course of that relationship um, where they say something. It's really extremely broad because it doesn't just, it's not just confined to a complaint of, sexu of a sexual nature. It's about anything to do with, it's any communication between those two people before or after the alleged offence and about anything they've said. So it's an extremely broad provision. What, there seems to be a bit of a trend at the moment to, to explore the, the confidential communication no matter what. Just that if it arises on the materials, go ahead and seek leave to issue a subpoena to find out about the com communication. That's not necessarily the best course because there are things that can go wrong in that process. And you also need to think about why you're doing it. What's the defence in the case? How does it relate to the fact in issue? For example, um, if it's a, a didn't happen case, you need to think about that in terms of why you'd seek access to a school counsellor's notes. How does that, how does that assist? Um, or a belief in age case, case, for example. You just need to think about how does that go to, for example, your client's belief in the age of the complainant. So it's not just a matter of just doing it because it seems to arise in the material. You need to have real objective and, and think about how it relates to the facts in issue. The, um, they can be, access to a confidential communication can be a useful tool because you can find out, for example, that a complainant has given an entirely different account of something that's occurred or a significantly different um, detail in an account, which may be useful, as it may go to their credit. Um, and otherwise, you might also find out that no report has been made at all, which in the circumstances may be very unusual, depending on um, how the confidential communication came about. For example, if a... Um, complainant was to see their school counsellor a day after an alleged assault and says absolutely nothing about it, that may be, of course, relevant in the circumstances. 
in considering whether it's appropriate to make an application for leave to be able to access confidential communications is, is, a, is, is the question that needs to be asked when it arises on the material in some way. And just because it does arise doesn't mean you should do it. And there are risks in sometimes getting access to, to material and what that discloses. For example, you might uh, find that there's a further al allegation that's uncovered which was forgotten by a um, teenage complainant, for example, or um, overlooked by them because of the, so many things that had happened that they just uh, missed that detail. You might then find that following that, the, the, those confidential communications being revealed, there's a further statement and, or a further ver and a further charge. So there's a real risk to opening that up when there's really nothing that you can achieve from it. And the other risk, of course, is that there's um, similarly a risk that you'll find out a bit of detail that you didn't want to know. Um, and I had, a, I had a case recently where there were, was, there were some confidential communications disclosed, which were counsellors' notes. And in those, it actually disclosed the existence of a bite mark, which the complainant had communicated, this was an adult case, but the complainant had communicated to the counsellor, um, which the complainant had an actual no, no memory at all of that but it's in the notes and then you're stuck with that. So, and then that's difficult to, to, to deal with, really. Uh, so just things like that to bear in mind when seeking to access confidential communications and thinking about whether you want to do it. The other side of that, I suppose, or in addition to all that, is that if it, if it doesn't assist, if, you, if you, view, you think that it doesn't assist you, don't do it, don't waste time doing it because if there's no basis, the court won't allow it. Um, and you just waste time having the application listed, subpoenaing or s making application for leave to subpoena parties um, when you really have no basis to do it, there's no point. However, on the other hand, if, for example, you made the application to the magistrate's court we, and there's a real basis for it in your view and that's refused, you can always do it again in the county court once um, your client's committed to stand trial if that's the case. So you can have a second, second go there. The other thing I want to say was just about subpoenas more generally because um, they seem to be less and less used and perhaps that's because of 32C applications, the confidential communications applications, that um, people tend to forget that there can be a real use in just subpoenaing. DHS records might be relevant, for example, in a particular case. The other example is phone records and phone records, particularly in cases involving teenagers, can be very significant because they can uh, show timelines that otherwise don't accord with an account um, or inconsistencies and things like that. So phone records are very, very important in my view. Finally, I'm just conscious of the time, in relation to social media, specifically in relation to Facebook, it can be such a useful tool for defence because just about every teenage girl, if not boy as well, I'm not sure, but just about every teenage complainant will have their own Facebook page and that can be um, a great tool. For example, you might have a teenage girl who's 13 who poses, um, who places on her, profi pro her Facebook profile that she's 18. Um, of course, that is, that is great in a case where you're, it's a belief in age case and you're suggesting that, for example, your client's been told the same thing in relation to age. So that sort of piece of evidence can then be used. Um, Another example, of course, is uh, on, a f on a Facebook page about a complainant being out all night, um, despite the fact that there's apparently an alleged sexual assault at a certain earlier hours in the evening, they continue to go out and there's a record of that um, on their page. Or in fact, there's some sort of, um, they're in fact out and about when they allege that this, is, this sexual assault has occurred. So just things like that that you could um, potentially gain access to. And the only other element is just in terms of, and I've seen this happen a few times, there's actually ongoing contact between an accused and a complainant of an intimate kind um, involving Facebook. And that can, uh, of course, go to a complainant's credit, particularly in a rape case. That's all I wanted to say this morning. Um, sorry to be fast and brief, but um, as Michael said, this will be available um, and it's really just my observations about trials and things that you might find useful uh, that will be available I think on our website uh, later today. So thanks for your time.
Thank you very much for attending. Thank, thank both our presenters also for interesting and thorough papers. And we'll leave it at that. Good morning. <laughs>